All right. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to jump into week two of our series on parenting. And uh, Ryan, if you can go ahead and pull up the slides. And we, at some point, we've got to get like a clicker. So we're not saying, next slide, please, next slide. We'll figure out. We've, we've got to upgrade some stuff on that. Just, just get a laser and we'll act like that's what it is. And you just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That'll work. That'll work. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we, um, we don't have internet access again. We're in the middle of troubleshooting. It's more than just service interruption or something. We've got to figure out what's going on. But that means that uh, we're not online. We'll post online later. If you're here and you weren't here last week and you missed last week's lesson, it is online now. Uh, we'll post this probably later this afternoon. Um, so I encourage you, please go back and listen to um, the first one if you missed it, uh, because I've intentionally trying to build uh, this, this series I want to build. And we've started with the important things. And you could argue that the, this one and last one should be flipped. Today's probably the most important lesson um, of the whole series. But uh, I wanted to set the ground kind of set the stage. Uh, just to recap, if you can go to the next slide, we talked about nine principles that we're going to keep in mind as we go through uh, the rest of this series, as we think about being parents. I encourage you to uh, think through these and adapt these. The first one was, number one, we want to take a principled approach, that this isn't just uh, rules, cookie cutter that we can stamp out. It's, it's the reason why there's a billion parenting books, right? You write a book and let me give you my method for parenting. Uh, great probably worked great for your kid. You, you've, it, it was very successful. That's why you wrote a book. And there's probably a lot of people that are going to buy that book and it works for them. But there's probably more people that buy that book and it's like, ah, it doesn't work for me. There's no one size fits all for parenting, for life in general. So we're, t we're taking a principled approach. And then we have to apply these principles to our, um, our circumstances. We talked about our priorities, that we uh, have to put God first, that uh, our marriage relationship has to come before our children. And then our children and our families should come before the rest of the community, should come before ministry, should come before the church, should come before our work. Now, obviously, things like work often are in service to our family, but if we get those priorities out of order, we risk damaging things. But if we get them in order, then we can build a very strong foundation, and uh, you know, the foundation supports the strength of the next layer. So our, our family should be a high priority in our life. We talked about our responsibilities to God, recognizing that this is not just um, you know, something that we do or just the, the circle, cycle of life, but we have a calling from God to teach and to raise our children. And our children are themselves a gift from God. Uh, this should impact how we relate to them, how we uh, treat them. Uh, we should recognize they're not just, you know, the old, uh, Andrew just said one phrase prior to this, I'm going to probably reference later in just the old, but another one of the old phrases, you know, I, I brought you into this world, I can take you out, right? <laughs> I have said that to my children. However, what I actually recognize is that uh, God gave them to me, and so I treat them as a precious gift and responsibility from Him. Uh, as we parent, we want to remember this core value that God built into our world, which is this freedom of choice, that He, he has given us the ability to make choices and deal with the consequences of it, and that is a fundamental part of becoming a, an adult, becoming, uh, you know... And not just as an adult, even as a child, we have this freedom to choose. And as parents, we have to be very respectful of that. We talked about the main goal of parenting, uh, raising, discipling children so they become fully functional adults. That le led into the next one, which was we recognize that they start completely helpless, unable to do literally anything for themselves. And the goal of parenting is that by the time they leave the nest, they are equipped with everything they need to succeed in life. It doesn't mean they're completely done. They're going to keep learning and growing, but they should have a foundation that will help them excel in anything. We talked about children being kind of full people from the beginning, that they're uh, not just this like half-done thing, but they're already full people, that uh, they're not little mini-adults. They're their own thing, but they have emotions just like we do. They have an inner thought life just like we do. Um, and we talked about the fact that we're playing a long game. This isn't just a day-by-day -day thing, but we're in this for the long haul. And there's one other we're going to add, but I wanted to take today to touch on it, and that is this principle of unconditional love. Uh, so the next thing, Ryan, if you can take me to the next slide. 
I want to remind you, and this is a very famous passage of Scripture we're going to touch on here. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This, this, just for context, Paul is teaching the Corinthians, and chapter 12, he's explaining the spiritual gifts. So this is beyond just the normal everyday life of a Christian, right? We have uh, a walk with God, we pray, we have spiritual disciplines, but there are supernatural spiritual gifts that operate in the church. Things like prophecy, things like tongues and interpretation, things like healing, things like words of faith and words of wisdom. And that's all of chapter 12, t- Paul's talking about that. Then he gets to the end of this discussion of supernatural spiritual gifts that God has given to the church to help it to grow and be strong. And then that brings us into here. And kind of in contrast to all these things, Paul says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I don't have love, if I can talk with angels, if I can speak in tongues, if I have the ability to talk to all men, if I communicate well, but I don't have love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, y'all know me well enough that I would love to have understand all mysteries. It seems like the more I understand, the more mysteries there are to be understood. But I could plumb the depths of all mysteries and knowledge. But if I don't have love, it doesn't matter. If I could have all faith, if I could remove mountains, but if I don't have love, it doesn't mean anything. I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver my body up to be burned, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. So Paul is reminding us here, we see that love is more important than sound logic, than good reasoning, than the ability to communicate It's more important than knowledge, sound doctrine, spirituality, quote-unquote. It's more important than outward works of the Spirit. And indeed, love really is the result of an inward work of the Spirit. Love is more important than duty and sacrifice. And this is one of the, you know, sometimes you'll hear people, uh, especially outside Christian circles, talk about altruism, right? That altruism is fundamentally selfish. Like this just is part of the human condition. The reason that we're nice to each other is because it's good for us to be nice to each other. That, that fundamentally, it's still a selfish desire. But, and there may be some truth to that, I suppose. But I'll argue another point here I'm about to make, that love is from God, that that's an example of what happens when you detach the idea of love from the source of love. Because what we see here is even if I'm completely altruistic, even if I, I give of myself to the point of self-sacrifice and death. But if it's not done in love, if it's done for me, if it's not done with love, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. This is the core of the Christian walk in general. Love is the supreme virtue. Love is the, the highest calling. We touched last time briefly on uh, Jesus' summary of the whole Old Testament, right? Uh, we, we used that to motivate our priority for family, was that, that the instruction was to love God and to love others. That was the way that Jesus interpreted all of delivered scripture prior to that point. The entire work of the law was to love God and to love others. So when we think about parenting, I think we, most of us hopefully attach love to the idea of parenting. We love our children. But if we're going to talk about it seriously, we have to spend some time talking about love, what it means Specifically, how does it apply in our parenting? So I'll add to Paul, uh, not to add to the scripture, but because I don't think Paul was being exhaustive here, but if I continue to apply this principle, I think loving our children is more important than getting things right. Loving our children is more important than how we're perceived or how, how they're perceived. Loving our children is more important than their physical needs. Not that we shouldn't meet their physical needs, but you can meet their physical needs, and without love, it ultimately doesn't profit anything. Love is more important than disciplining our children. Love is more important than being fair to our children. Now, I'm putting up a bit of a false dichotomy. Really, love is interwoven in all these things. Good discipline is done in love. Our love for our children will try to see them treated fairly. And, but oftentimes, I don't treat my children fairly. I treat them mercifully. I treat them graciously. I treat them with love because right. I don't want bad for them. I want good for them because I love them. More important than anything is love. And then Paul ended 1 Corinthians 13. Don't worry, we'll read the rest of it here in a minute. But Paul ended Corinthians 13 with this. Faith, hope, and love abide. 
And I'm skipped over some stuff, but he points out, you know, all those gifts that I talked about in chapter 12, all the other things are eventually going to cease. We're going to get to the end of a need for prophecy. When we get to heaven, we're not going to need heal- miracles of healing. We're not going to need words of wisdom and all these spiritual gifts. They're for the church now to get us through this world. But even in heaven, even till the end of all time and beyond, faith, hope, and love will continue. And of those three, the greatest is love. So the foundation of our parenting, if we want to parent biblically, and I would argue that's the best way to parent, the foundation has to be love. So what does it mean to love unconditionally? And some of y'all, uh, we touched on this earlier this year as well, so this may be familiar, but not, there's enough months in between, I think, we could use a refresher. Take me to the next slide, uh, Ryan. What is unconditional love? There are many things we could say about unconditional love, but I'm going to pull together six. One, love is from God, for God is love. Ryan, uh, go to the next slide. I'll have you come back to this one, but I want to read the passage. First John chapter 4. John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Bring us back to the previous uh, screen. So love is from God, for God is love. And we, if you look in our world today, uh, love is a, a core component of how all of us talk to each other. But it's very interesting to compare and contrast the way that different people talk about love, the way that different parts of society talk about love, how love is presented in different scenarios. Hollywood, the, the entertainment industry, books are going to present a very specific view of love. And uh, we could spend a lot of time arguing about what's right about that, where, what it gets wrong. Um, I already told you, you know, one of the explanations for love from a non-religious uh, point of view is this, this altruism that comes from ultimately self-good. Uh, and what you'll notice as you compare and contrast these is there's a fundamental difference when people understand and tie love back to God as the source versus trying to find some other genesis for love. And it makes a difference. It's not just an academic point. Because if love is from God, then He is ultimately our definition of love. And all these other things, the fact that it is true that when we're loving, it's better for us. That when we give love out, more love comes back to us. But without God as the source, it's easy to to get that twisted around and say, well, that's why we love. It's fundamentally selfish. Or, you know, I need love, therefore I've got to act in these ways because I'm chasing love. It's no, no. I need God. He's the definition of, of love. He's the source of love. And if I can get close to Him... He will help me to love in a healthy way. God is the source of love. The next thing, which is one of the biggest misconceptions y'all have heard from me before, we feel like love in our society, it's a feeling. It's a, uh, you know, romantic love is a feeling of love. But we don't just say it for romantic love. We say it for all kinds of love, right? You can fall out of love with your spouse or, you know, I I don't know if y'all have ever heard someone say this, but I've heard people say, you know, I just don't know if I love my kids. Like, I just don't think, it feels bad. I feel horrible saying it but I don't really love my kids. And it's all this misconception that love is this thing that happens to us. That's this emotion we experience. And there is an emotional aspect to love, but love at its fundamental core is a choice. Love is when we make a commitment to someone else. It's a commitment that the giver chooses to make. So in in a very real sense, love is not about the recipient of the love at all. Love is about the one who's choosing to love. Now, that can impact the recipient, and there's a relationship that develops, and the relationship is about both parts, right? The, the relationship is fundamentally two people, but I can love someone even if they never return my love or my care at all. Love is fundamentally a choice that I make. And that's why, you know, we can say things like, I can promise my wife I'm going to love her till the day I die. That's one, this is one of those immediate consequences from how you view love. If love is just an emotion that happens to you, If love is that nice feeling, then I love you now, but I can't promise I'm going to love you in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. I have no idea what's going to happen in 20 years. That's true. I have no idea what life's going to be like in 20 years. But what I know is that for my part, I'm going to choose to love her. I choose to be committed to her, regardless of what happens 10 years from now, 20 years from now. That's the fundamental of love is I've chosen to make her a priority. And the same is true for our children. Now, we get, get, God's made it easy um, 
I don't want to jump off the, the main topic too much. I mean, I was afraid I was going to have to stretch stuff out and really go into it, but I'm going to run out of time. Uh, I don't want to get off parenting too much, but this is one of the reasons why intimacy is so important in marriage, is because it's part of how God enforces that bond of love. With parenting, it's different. It, it's the same, but it's different. Some of the same chemical processes happen, but when that, how, how many of y'all have, have had children and been in, in the room when you first hold your child and experienced that feeling of like, you know, maybe I was anticipating this or I, I, I don't know what to feel, but when I hold that baby, right. it's like, bam. It just, there's something about it. Well, there's this whole chemical process that goes on the brain. There's all these hormones that flood our brain and attach us to that. Like God made it this way. There's an inbuilt attachment that comes from your children. But just like with marriage, you have to nurture that over time. And so when you hear people say things, I don't know if I love my kid or not, well, I'm, I'm not trying to be judgmental because I mean, the people I've heard say that, they want to, they just, it's like, well, you don't understand. You choose to love your children. You choose to be their parent. You, you know, you chose to make them, but now you have to choose daily whether you're going to be there for them, whether you're going to love them. Love is a choice. And then the next four come directly from 1 Corinthians 13. So, Ryan, if you can go two slides forward, and I'll just use the verses. Love is patient and kind. It's gentle. Love is patient. Now, in the context of parenting, this is immediate applications, right? <laughs> patient and kind and gentle. Uh, you know, so I'm, I did bring you into this world, but I'm not going to take you out. I'm going to be patient. It focuses on others. Love doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. So it's humble. It's not self-centered. It's not prideful and envious. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. So love wants what's good for the recipient, right? It doesn't insist on its own way. It doesn't have to be about me, but what is right for you? What is right for, how can I see the good for you? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. And then I, I did want to touch on this briefly, just in passing, because I never, it is one of those things that I thought, but it's, it jumped out at me in Scripture when I was reading this again. How many of y'all have read 1 Corinthians 13 multiple times in your life? See if this hits you any differently. We know, in part, uh, so love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. And then the last piece that I read earlier now, these three, faith, hope, and love abide. And the greatest of these is love. Now, how many of y'all have heard, and we, we use this like, you know, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. We hear that. Some, you know, we try and draw conclusions from that. Or we hear this verse by itself. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. We use that verse by itself. And then we this one. For now, we see in a mirror only, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I'm known. We use that verse by itself to talk about the difference between here and in heaven. But I don't know why it's taking me this long to see it this clearly. What is Paul talking about in this whole passage? Chapter 12, gifts of the Spirit, supernatural works of God. Chapter 13, love, this enduring, abiding, highest gift that God has given to us. And then here, he's tying the two together. Those are going to pass away. This will never pass away. So what is the, the part? You said we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. What is the partial? The partial is the healing. Partial is the prophecy, the, the tongues and interpretation, all those gifts. That's partial. What is the perfect? Love is the perfect. And we are waiting the full fulfillment of love. And then he goes on. When I was a child, I thought, and reasoned like a child, but now that I'm an adult, I put away childish things. Well, what are the childish things he's talking about? In context, to what he's just written. Prophecy. 
Healing, tongues and interpretation, the spiritual gifts. What is the mature adult thing? Love. Love. When love has become, when, I'm, when love matures in me fully, I'm not going to need those gifts. Now, we believe those gifts are still active, but look at what he's saying. Now we see in a mirror dimly, we have to talk to each other this way. We, we need those words of knowledge because I have no other way to understand it. We need the tongues and interpretation because we need to hear from God. This is the way God's working and building up the church, but what is it going to mean to know even as I'm fully known? What's the parallel? Love. He sets up three parallels here. Partial, perfect. Childish, mature. Dim understanding, like in a, a mirror. And of course, y'all have probably heard the explanation. You know, the mirror that Paul's talking about, it's not a mirror like we have. It's, you know, if you take metal and you polish it to a high shine, that might be what Paul's talking about. But if you ever have one of those mirrors, it's not nearly as revealing as a mirror we have today. Now mirrors, basically, it's like seeing. But then the mirrors were dim. You couldn't get a clear picture. It didn't have the same technology. So those are the three. And the comparison for the former is the miraculous supernatural gifts. And the comparison for the latter, the perfect, the mature, clearly is love. So I hope you found that interesting. That was really hit me. Uh, Ryan, can you um, go back two slides real quick just to see that, that list again? I want to kind of point these out to you. And I can give you my slides if anyone wants a copy. So three things I want to focus on. Love is from God. God is the definition of love. And that right there, understanding that is such a huge part of our journey as maturity and Christian. Understanding the love of God. Because we, we interpret God's relationship with us in light of all the relationships we've had. We have our understanding of love and we project that on God. And a big part of drawing closer to God is Him showing you this is what it means for me to love you. This is how I love you. Love is a choice. It's a commitment that we make, the one who's giving love. Love is patient. It's kind. It's gentle. It focuses on the other. It's humble. It's not self-centered. It's not arrogant. It's not envious or prideful. Love wants, hopes, believes good for the recipient of the love. I'm going to endure until the good is shown. I'm going to hope until the good thing happens. I want you to succeed. And love doesn't end. So let's shift gears here in the second half of our conversation, what does this mean in the context of parenting? Well, I think y'all can make direct applications. Or actually, I think I had a couple more scriptures before I go there. Ryan, can you go uh, maybe a couple slides forward? Perfect. See, Ryan knows what he's doing. Just need that laser pointer. That's right. So let me give you a couple biblical examples of what love looks like. You'll notice a commonality here. 1 John 4, we read part of this. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. God gave of Himself to make up the difference for us. That's what He says love is. Romans 8 Paul writes, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's love. Is that while you were unworthy, I came and made a way for you to have a relationship. And then Ephesians 5, this is one that um, I could talk a long time about, but it's not the topic today. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So, this is the example of love that we have in Scripture, is this willingness to go beyond, to put myself aside, to do what is best for the one that I love, regardless of what it costs me. Unconditional love. Go to the next slide, Ryan. All right, so as a parent, one of the ways I think this, this needs to be expressed Our, our love for our children needs to be expressed as individualized parental attention. Your love needs to be an active thing for your children. Andrew said earlier, children are to be seen and not heard, right? That's one of the, the, um, one of the ways that our culture has thought about children in the past, is that they are a resource, they are, um, 
they're a part of the family, but they're, they're something I'm raising, there's something I'm shepherding up, and uh, you know, they're not really adults, they don't really have a say, they don't really have a, a reason to interject their thoughts because they're not ready to be a part of society, they're my kids. Um, and there's an inherent, you know, here's me, here's my kids, you guys can just wait until I'm ready for you. And there's some truth to that, right? I mean, we, I think you do need to recognize that children are not adults. They, uh, there's a lot of conversations they're not equipped to handle and to be a part of. And, and so, you know, there's some, some truth to that. But by and large, our culture has kind of discarded that maxim, and I think for good reason. Because um, in a very real sense, like you're not just this clutch of, you know, chicks or eggs that I'm waiting to get to a point of usefulness is I care about you personally. I care about you individually. I, I want to have a relationship with you. Because I, because I love you, I want to have a relationship with you. So what does my love say? I think, this is, this is my belief, that our children need to know that you love them. This needs to be uh, told to them explicitly. You need to tell them that you love them. You need to show them what love means. You need to tell them, you know, this is what it means to love. This is, I love you, here's why. Here's what I mean when I say I love you. And then they need to see it in your actions and in the way you live. It needs to be a consistent part of how you raise them is with love. And I'll come to these here in a second. Um, there was a, uh, there's, there's so much science around relationships and child rearing and all that. And um, I'm not going to go too deep on any of that, but I wanted to touch on some of the thoughts today. And, and I'm always a bit skeptical. I mean, the scientific method is you have a hypothesis and you test it, right? But even if you validate the hypothesis, it's not really under, taken as a fact until that replicates, right? Until multiple, if it's true, multiple people should be able to run the same experiment and get the same results. So social sciences are really hard. Because there's so many variables. How do you control for all the variables? How do you make sure that you're actually seeing the effect that you're looking for? I mean, take dieting. We've done so many studies on dieting. It's like, well, there's so many confounding factors. It worked for this group, but it didn't work for that group. I can't replicate it because, well, it turns out that this group was eating a different type of food. Or did, you know, there's just, it's impossible. So I'm always a bit skeptical about social studies. Uh, not because I disagree with the process, but because I think we just need to be very... Um, well, let me put it this way. When I see a scientist who's trying to run an experiment uh, about maybe like the physical properties of a material, right? Generally, I don't care too much about him or her, right? right? I look at the parameters of the experiment. I try and see what makes sense. I see if I can do it myself. But the evidence is pretty plain and clear. It speaks for itself. When I read a study from someone in the social sciences, I'm very interested in, okay, what's your background? What do you believe? How did you raise your children? Do you have children? Do you, are you married? Do you have a relationship? How are you doing this? Because there's so much variability that if we're not careful, we are seeing the, the result of a worldview rather than the evidence doesn't just speak for itself. There's too much possibility. And I'll, I'll touch on this briefly in the past because I'm already spending more time on this than I wanted to. But you can look it up. A couple years back, there was a minor crisis in uh, social sciences with re repli replicability, goodness. A whole bunch of fundamental, foundational studies for the whole field of social science. People went back and tried to reproduce, the, like, let's do it again, let's run the study, we should get the same results. And by and large, they failed to be able to reproduce the majority of them for these kind of reasons. Uh, a kind of um, one person, or I don't know, a saying I've heard that I found very humorous is the, uh, you know, Modern social science is the study of young white college kids, right? All the studies are done on that demographic, and that's the conclusion you draw. All that to say, I'm more interested in what the Word of God says, but I'm always interested in what people who are genuinely trying to study understand. <clears throat> Why do I say that? There was, there was a, how many of y'all all have heard of attachment theory? couple, child educators, maybe, you've heard of attachment theory. Does anybody feel comfortable summarizing it briefly? If not, that's okay. It's not a pop quiz. This is, you weren't expecting this on Sunday. 
So I'm going to chapter three. I'm going to do an uns- insufficient job of summarizing it, but very high level, the idea was that the way that your parents um, interact with you at your earliest dates, from birth to year one or maybe year two, the kind of relationship they have with you sets kind of a template for the kinds of relationships you're going to have in the rest of your life. So if your parents were very loving and close and touched you a lot and showed a lot of physical affection, then you're going to develop, then they develop a secure attachment with you and you're going to be developing secure attachments with other people. Whereas if your parents were very hands-off or weren't really there, didn't interact with you, didn't really touch you, telling you that you loved, they loved you, then you develop insecure attachments and that's characterized by a, a lack of confidence, a lack of trust, and it, that's the kind of relationship you're going to form for the rest of your life. And, I don't know necessarily that I agree with, and I think by and large, uh, the field has left attachment theory as a kind of, we don't believe that what happens in the first or second year of your life fundamentally defines all your relationships the rest of your life. By and large, people have concluded, no, you can continue to learn and grow after that point. But one of the things I think it did do, it was very helpful in, was it defined these kinds of relationships. What does it look like to have a secure relationship? What does it look like to have an insecure relationship where you're not really closely attached? And how, what kinds of relationships do we form as adults? Right. And I'll just say this. We should be giving our children security in our relationship. Yes. This is one of the things that, that an unconditional love gives them that they cannot get from anyone else. Brother Gossett said this many times. They'll have lots of friends. They'll have coworkers. They'll have bosses. They can replace friends. They can get new friends. They can replace bosses. They cannot replace their parents. You're the only parents they get. And even, we'll look at, for example, the case of adoption. Good adopted parents do everything they can to do that. But even in the best of circumstances, there's still that, well, we're trying to provide for you what you should have had from your biological parents. And that works to varying degrees. Some people, there's still a whole, well, I'm thankful for my adopted parents. They love me, but I still wish... You can't replace parents. And this is what we, we are the only ones who can give this to our children the way we can. Now, God can make up the difference. And this is where it's, it's wonderful to be connected to the source of love because he can put people in your kid's life to make up the difference if you don't have, for example, both spouses or, or if, uh, you know, coming to, we come to, say we get to halfway through and like, man, I wish I'd done things differently. Well, God can make up the difference. But, this is the goal, to give them this security, give them this love. Jonathan, I, I believe it goes even deeper than what you're saying. There, there's a genetic disposition that human beings have that you understand your children at a fundamental level that it's almost impossible because there, you, you, and it's why that, that the ideal situation is always that a man and a woman raise their children together because between the two of them, the genetics of those children come from those parents, and they understand them at a fundamental level that that outside of that, just you you'll never share that DNA. Um, nobody else shares that DNA with them like you do, and and so I think it's it's why God made the family unit the way He made the family unit. Yes, you can't you can't replace parents. God can bridge the gap. But I'll just point out, that's a miracle. Like, that's something God can do. That's not something we do very well or even can do oftentimes. God can miraculously bridge the difference. His grace is sufficient. But that's a God thing. So here's what I want my love to tell my children. What I want them to hear from me explicitly, I tell them this at various points, and what I want them to feel from me through how I interact with them through my, the way I discipline, through the way I, I uh, teach them, through the way I talk to them, through the way you matter and you're valuable to me. I care for you and I'm on your side. Doesn't mean I agree with everything you're going to do. <clears throat> in fact, as your parent, a lot of times I'm going to have to correct you. But even in that correction, I care for you because I love you. And I'm on your side. I'm not against you. I might be, we might have to talk about something, but the, the motivation for that is because I'm on your side. Right. I'm here for you and I'm not leaving. And this is, unfortunately, such a big one in our culture. Like, uh, you can't, one, there was one minister I heard said it this way to his congregation, but it should be absolutely true for us, is I love you, there's nothing you can do about it. 
I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't upset me and make me stop loving you. You can't hurt me and make me stop loving you. I mean, you can't upset me, you can't hurt me, but it's not going to make me stop loving you. You can push me away, but I'm still going to love you. You can tell me that you don't want me, but I'm still going to love you. And in the context of children, there are going to be times, if you do your job, well, I mean, not say that. More likely than not, there's going to be at some point in their life where they tell you something like, I hate you, I don't want you. They don't mean it. They may mean it, but they, they're not saying that from a mature point of view. They're expressing emotions. And a lot of times we as parents, like, we take that personally. Because it hurts. But I'm choosing to love you regardless of what you do. I'm here for you, and I'm not leaving you. There's nothing, as, as much as in my power, I might, the Lord might take me, circumstances, but if I have any ability, I'm going to be here for you. And you can trust that. You're safe with me. You can come to me if you have a problem, and I will protect you. I will help you. If you get in trouble, I can't shield you from all the consequences necessarily, but I will as much as I can, as much as I can do so in a healthy way, or at least I'll help you with the consequences, because I'm here for you. I, I want to be a safe place for you. You're safe with me. I'm your, I'm your dad. I'm the one that you come and I'm going to hug you. I'm going to wrap you up. I'm mom. I'm the one that you can come and cry on and talk to. And I want you to succeed. These are all corollaries of what unconditional love is, right? It's not about me. I want, I'm here for you. I'm, I'm going to be kind because I love you. I'm going to be gentle because I love you. All right, we're coming to the end of our time and I have a lot more to say, so we'll have to save it for later. But I want to touch on two things more and then I'll let you go. I think this is basically the end of the slides, Ryan. So um, let me take this. So all of our, and we'll do this for the next four weeks, we're going to talk about how do we handle discipline, how do we handle communication and understanding, um, how do we handle emotions, how do, we, how do we let go of our children, how do we deal with conflict between us and them and between our children. And all of those, we will do it through this lens of what, how can I best help them? How can I love them? How can I show them love? And uh, we're not always going to get it right. We're not always going to be perfect. We're going to, there's going to be times where uh, we don't love them perfectly, where we take some action that undermines the love we're trying to show, and we're going to have to address that. But I mentioned it a little bit last time. It's one of the attitudes I want us to have as we think about this as we parent is, uh, I'm not interested in what's right or wrong. I'm not interested in uh, you know, getting what's fair. I'm interested in what's, uh, let me rephrase. Uh, thinking in context of you know, you, your kids come and they argue and they fight. And it's like, well, maybe you had a right to be angry. Maybe they did something wrong and you had a right. And maybe they broke your toy and so justice would be that you break their toy. But is that going to make it better? Right? As a parent, a lot of times, I'm not going to say, well, is it fair? Is this what I want? Is this the right thing? My, my question is, is this good for them? Does this show love for them? They mouthed off to me. They deserve for me to, 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 to talk back to them. They deserve for me to come down on them. Well, why did they mouth off? Was it rebellious? Was it because they're trying to... Was it because they're hurting? Was it because they don't understand? Like, instead of me just doing what I can and what's fair, what shows love? What shows them that I care about them? Okay, you just said some very inappropriate things to me as your parent, and we're going to have to deal with that, but how do I do that in a way that shows you that I love you, that shows you that I care about you, that it's not about me getting my rights, it's not about me showing you that you're the kid and I'm the parent, you don't do that. Like, maybe that's true, but it's because you need to understand respect for authority and respect for other people, and that's just not an appropriate way to do, but it's, I'm not personally affronted and offended. I'm not personally getting vengeance on you because you attacked me. I love you. I want you to succeed. And I know if you take that attitude into other relationships, you're going to damage the other relationships, so let's deal with that attitude. But I love you. You're safe with me even when you're a little punk. All right. Two things, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you go uh, for today. Love, like I said, it needs to be expressed. It needs to be expressed. Phys- uh, you need to say it. It needs to be expressed in what you do. And it needs to be expressed physically. And our culture doesn't have a healthy view of this. And we struggle. But physical touch is such an integral part of how we humans express and feel love. Let me read you a couple, a couple uh, 
These are the conclusions from a number of different studies uh, and psychologists that have counseled people. Here's one specifically on the effects of skin hunger. I don't know if you've heard, skin hunger is this idea that at some point we all long for physical connectedness and touch. Specifically, compared with people with less skin hunger, people who feel more affection deprived are less happy, more lonely, more likely to experience depression and stress. In general, they're in worse health. They have less social support, lower relationship status. They experience more mood and anxiety disorders, more secondary immune diseases, those that are acquired rather than genetic. They are more likely to have uh, alexithymia, which is a condition that impairs their ability to express and understand emotion. They're more likely to be preoccupied or have a fearful avoidant attachment style. They're less likely to form secure attachments. People that, that don't feel they have physical affection. We know from research that Children need to be touched, babies particularly. Let me just read this. Touch can ease pain. It can lift to present. It can, it can possibly increase the odds that a team will win. But touch is even more vital than this. Babies who are not held, nuzzled, and hugged can stop growing, and if the situation lasts long enough, even die. Researchers discovered this when they're trying to figure out why some orphanages had infant mortality rates of 30 to 40 percent. We now know that orphanages are not suitable places for infants. Babies ages zero to five simply do not receive enough stimulation in group residential care to develop to their full capacity. If kids don't get healthy touch, they're more vulnerable to predators who can harm them. One other that I'll read here, and then I'll touch on it a little myself. In recent years, some researchers have been studying, focused on a different, more subtle kind of wordless communication, physical contact. Momentary touches, they say, whether an exuberant high five, a warm hand on the shoulder, or a creepy touch to the arm, can communicate an even wider range of emotion than gestures and expression, and sometimes do so more quickly and accurately than words. It is the first language we learn, says uh, Dacre Keltner. He's a professor of psychology at the University of California. Our richest means of emotional communication is this language of touch throughout life. When we think about loving our children, we think about all the things I talked about previously, and I think we should, and we'll continue to talk about that. But before we left this one here, I want to encourage you, just as a practical matter, the goal here is to create a foundation of unconditional love. Because unconditional love provides your children with security, that, that they, don't ha- they don't worry about things. If my kids get to, like, I hope my kids are getting to the age now where I have to tell them what it means for someone to not love their children. I hope that they have to learn what it means to not have loving relationships because they don't have experience with that themselves. It gives them peace. It gives them trust. I have talks with my kids on subjects that a lot of parents are afraid to because I'm not worried, because I trust that they'll talk to me about what's in their mind and that they'll honestly listen to what I say, and I can because they trust me. That's born out of love. It creates openness and transparency. It creates a healthy context for discipline. You need a foundation of unconditional love. As the last, uh, one of them I read alluded to, we we as humans have a fundamental need for love. We were created for relationship. We were created by a God who loves us and wants us to be in loving relationships. When we don't have that, it can be incredibly damaging. And if we don't show our children as they grow that they're loved, there's a good chance they're going to put themselves in all sorts of dangerous situations in poor relationships as they grow because they're seeking love, but they don't know how to recognize it. They need to hear it from us, and they need to see it from us. And as a, as a matter of practical, as a practical nature, you should love your children. Give them hugs. Touch them. Let them know that you care for them. It's such a small thing, but there's nothing like the security of a father's embrace holding you. Nothing says, I've got you, you're okay, it's going to be all right, like daddy giving you a hug. There's nothing that says you're special, you're valuable, like a mother reaching out and hugging their child. And you'll notice with, with my children, it's probably to the point where, um, you know, my wife is not a super touchy, she's just left the room, so I, 
Sorry, love. <laughs> She's not a super touchy person in general. And uh, I am by default. That's just my, my nature. But I'm, I'm very proud of her because she has always shown our children affection physically. And it's to the point where our kids, like, they'll give us like 50 hugs before we go to bed. And it's because you're just trying to avoid going to bed. And you know that if you hug us, we'll hug you. So, you know, there's, there's lines. But if you're going to err, err on the side of showing your children verbally, through your actions, through touch, I love you. I care about you. If you can establish that as a foundation, then all the rest of it becomes much easier. And it's much easier to do it right and have a healthy outcome. All right, I know I've taken a bit more of your time. I appreciate it. This is the most important one, unconditional love. If we can learn to love our children unconditionally, if we can let that love for our children be the filter that all of the other interactions we have. Look, I want to teach my children to work hard. I want to teach my children how to stand up for themselves. I want to teach my children right and wrong. I want to teach them how to be respectful. I want to teach them how to, how to take a loss. I want to teach them all these hard things. But all of it has to come through. I don't want them to learn any of that if I can't teach them love. They've got to learn love first, and then all of that will follow through. Thank you for your time. Uh, as I said, this is, well, we'll have this posted online later. We're going to take a few minutes, and then we'll get into our main service. Uh, we're going to pick up next week probably on discipline, uh, and then we'll, we'll see where we go from there. God bless.